to follow that, but <laughs> <laughs> that's me underwater. And the most peculiar thing happens to me when I tell people, or when they find out that I have a world record. For some reason, I stop being normal and I become somehow different, which surprises me because without even thinking about it, people move me from this rather nice, comfortable, friendly box called us, and they put me in a little corner over there to a box called them. And I, I've always been fascinated by this because what if I wasn't actually different? What if I was just like you? Because if I was just like you, that would mean that you could make your dreams come true as well. Now, I don't know very many people who want to spend six hours underwater for a world diving record. But the thing about dreams is that they're not about being first in the world. They're about you doing something for the first time. And that means from the point of view of the person who is dreaming, all dreams are equal. Dreams take you from here, and they push you out there into the unknown, um, into a place called there. In order to get from here to there, you first have to get through your fear. And that's normally where the wheels start to fall off the bus and people start to give up on their dreams. Because we're not very good at this thing called fear. We don't get taught how to deal with it or what to do. But if you're serious about your dream, you have to find a way to get through it. You have to find a way to do whatever it takes in spite of your fear. Because your fear never goes away. That was the position I found myself in around about, well, not around about, exactly, the December the 31st of the year 2000. I'd spent four years trying to get deeper, and I just hadn't got anywhere. I'd stalled out at 121 meters, and I was tired. I was tired of talking about it. I was tired of thinking about it. I was tired of being laughed at for talking about it. I was very, very, very over this rather stupid, ridiculous, over-ambitious idea that I was special enough or good enough to become the deepest woman in the world. And I knew that I just couldn't live another year that I'd lived before. It was time to give up. And what better time to make a choice like that than New Year's? Then the strangest thing happened. Yeah, it is a bit cliche, I have to tell you. <laughs> the strangest thing happened, though, because the more I started to think about giving up, the more my dreams started to fight back. And I realized that if I gave up now without really trying, I would regret it till the day I died, which was an exceptionally worrying thought, because I'd been trying for four years, hadn't I? That question, that hadn't I? seemed to open up a door for me. And I suddenly realized that what I'd been doing for four years was holding on to the safe road. And there is a safe way to break a world record. You take someone who's been there already with you. In my case, a safe way meant taking fellow diver Nuno Gomez, the deepest man in the world, along with, and he would then take me back into his dive team. And when he was finished with his world record attempts, it would be my turn. Voila, one world record. He really wasn't buying into the whole idea, which left me with the hard way. The hard way had only me, literally only me. Every choice, every decision, everything I did would come back to me. There'd be nobody to hide behind, there'd be nobody to defend me, there'd be nobody to tell me whether what I was doing was right or wrong. The only way I could find that out was to actually go out and do it. And in deep diving, when you get it wrong, you normally get yourself dead which meant that I was petrified, with good reason to be petrified. The only problem was it didn't matter. It didn't matter that I had all these valid reasons to be afraid. The thing that mattered was that knowing that if I didn't try this, it would just eat away at me for the rest of my life. And that's when I made the news resolution that really changed everything. I committed to doing whatever it would take to get me deeper. And I would give up, because I honestly expected to, at the end of 2001, but only if I could know here, in that place where it's impossible to lie to myself, that I hadn't chickened out. And it wasn't even about getting a single meter deeper. It was living the year and not having chickened out. Well, with that in mind, there was nothing left to do but dive. So I scheduled a dive to 145 meters in one of only two places in South Africa where you can dive sub 100 meters. It's a place called Badkhat, and it's a flooded asbestos mine. The dive itself was going to be planned for a week because you don't just rock up and do a deep dive. 
There's a whole lot of work that you have to do beforehand, and it takes about five days to set it up. You've got to put your gear in, you've got to make sure everything's working, I've got to do practice dives, and most importantly, I've got to make sure that I've got enough cylinders in the water for five hours, because that's how long it would take me to do 145 meters. The other problem with this dive was that it was highly controversial. I would be the second person to ever dive that deep in Badghat, because of uh, the fact that it was a mine, none of my support divers would be able to reach me past 112 meters. And because I was having to navigate tunnels in order to get my depth, I was pretty much breaking every known rule about how to dive safely and successfully deeper than 100 meters, which meant I was petrified. A f feeling I should be comfortable with right now, but not really. To make things really worse, it rained nonstop, and we were camping. Every single day was a flat-out struggle just to get out of my tent and into the water and do what needed to be done. It got so bad and it got so hard that I was really this close to just saying, forget it, you know what, I think I can live with chickening out. Maybe at the end of the year I'll give it one more bash. And then I thought to myself, but hang on a minute, what if I wake up on the Saturday, which was when we were supposed to dive, and I feel like diving, what then? And then I realized that if I didn't do this part, if I didn't do the setup, I wouldn't even have the option of diving on Saturday. And that felt like a whole weight lifting off my shoulders. And before I knew it, Saturday arrived, and with it came the sun and the surprise in the form of a third support diver, all of which meant I really couldn't check it out. So I made the choice to do the first part of the dive, which is relatively simple. It's an eight-minute swim at 18 meters. Easy. When I got to the end of that, I'd be at the main shaft that went all the way down to 112, and I'd already done that once this week, so down I went. At 112 is where it starts to get a bit freaky. This is where most people don't go, and this is where I'd be losing all my support divers. But I figured 112 meters, the price of this was going to be five hours in the water, I may as well do the next part, which was a three-minute swim, and to where my next shaft would take me down deeper. So in I went. When I got to the next shaft, well, I suddenly figured I was 10 meters away from 122, which was a meter deeper, and then I could take the rest of the year off. Yes. <laughs> so in I went. At 122, I could not think of a single good reason to give up. More importantly, I couldn't think of a reason I could sell back on the surface to the guys who were supporting me. So I carried on going to 145. I can't explain the feeling when I came out of the water after that dive. It's one I'd never felt before in my entire life. It was one of complete elation and limitless possibility. It was more than that. I finally had something solid to stand on, which I'd never had before. And in one of those quirks of fate, which you normally really only read about in books, Within a couple of weeks, I had a fully sponsored world record attempt planned for the end of the year with most of Nuno Gomez's support team on board. Regrettably, my dive to 186 meters that year wasn't going to get me the world record, thanks to an Italian lady who beat me to the post just a couple of weeks before with a dive to 211 meters. <laughs> it, yes, it was quite depressing, actually. <laughs> It took me another four years to get to 221 and my name in the Guinness World Record. And it's taken me another nine years to find out what it was I'd done. Because there is quite simply nothing more useless than a diving world record. It just, <laughs> nothing. It doesn't translate back into the real world in any way. And I wanted that feeling of endless possibility, that feeling of solid ground. I wanted it in every moment of every day. I most particularly wanted it in every moment of every work day. And I figured that, well, I'd done it once. So I possibly, well, I should be able to do it again. All I'd need to do is work out what it was I did. And when I started to ask myself that question, I started to find myself always coming back to that dive, to that Easter. And yes, it had been about a choice between giving up or carrying on, but it had been about something so much more fundamental than that. It had been about choosing between believing in my fear or believing in my dream. And somehow I managed to choose the dream part. Even more importantly than that, I chose to live my dream. And in order to do that, I had to stop being me because I realized that who I was really had not been good enough. Who I was at that time 
had only been good enough to get me to 121 meters, and it wasn't going to get me a single meter deeper. In order to get deeper, I had to start being and doing the things that a world record holder would do. I had to become the deepest way before I ever, ever dived the depth. And that started to ask some interesting questions for me around what a dream is. Yes, dreams are about firsts. Yes, dreams are about fear. But what if dreams are about something more? What if dreams challenge your very notion about who you are? What if they're asking you, maybe you are good enough? What if you could too? Because let's face it, not all of us are born with what it takes. I'm standing here living proof I was not born with everything that it required to become the deepest. I had to go out and choose that. I had to go out and learn that for myself. And it started with that moment, just that one moment where I found my dare. That was the moment where I actually chose to stop listening to my fear and instead put all my energy and my attention onto my dream. That was the moment it started, because that was the moment I stopped thinking about it and started doing it. And it's a very interesting moment, because that moment is what I take back into every moment of every day right now. The ability to be able to choose to live with day in any moment of my day is what puts me in that box over there in the corner called us. No, wait, that's them, hey, we're us. I always get that mixed up, because I feel like I'm so normal. Because I can choose to live with day, I got to create my dream. And the thing about it is that it's not something that requires anything outside of yourself. It doesn't require the right education, it doesn't require the right mentor, the right school, the right parents. The only thing choosing to live with day requires is you, which means every person here right now can make that choice right here, right now. Think about it. That dream you have that you think isn't really going to happen, the one you've almost given up on, the dream that hasn't given up on you, well, what if you could too? When I chose to live with day, I created a world record. What could you create if you chose to live your life with day? And that's what I'd like to leave you with. A dare, if you will. I dare you to go out and find out. Go dare to create a life you would love to live. Thank you. <laughs>